it just got worse. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, an alarming report shows that these eight banks are the next to fail. And we've got the names and all the details of what's going on with them. Now, if you're wondering what we're doing at the FedEx corporate office in Plano, Texas today, well, it's not because we're trying to ship a package. FedEx just leaked some very interesting information about the state of the global economy, and we're here to find out more. Now, before we get into all of that, the Wall Street Journal just reported some very interesting data that shows the trend of the economy is not the direction the policymakers are saying it is. And let's head over there where we start today's show. The worker bidding war is over. Companies are now cutting pay for new hires. Now, I want you to understand why this is so important, because what do we keep hearing from Fed Chair Jerome Powell and all of his other minions is that we have a problem with wage growth. It's going up too much and too fast. And they're afraid that there's going to be what's called a wage price spiral, where wages go up and people spend more money than wages go up. People spend more money, and that drives consumer prices higher. Now, what they want to see, and I know for many of you this doesn't make any sense at all, they want to see your wage growth go way down to almost nothing so they can bring inflation down. And of course, we know that the Fed chief is speaking on Friday at Jackson Hole, so we're going to be curious to see what he says about this. But if what we're seeing here is true, well, it tells us the Fed has nothing to worry about in terms of wages going up. In fact, what we're going to see is layoffs go up. Wages essentially for people who change jobs climbed in recent years as companies competed for workers to fill pandemic-induced labor shortages as many boomers went into retirement. Now, as the job market cools and businesses become more cautious in their hiring, many companies are paying new recruits less than they just did months ago, and in some cases, months less. According to Zip Recruiter, among postings for more than 20,000 job titles, the average pay for a majority of the roles has declined from last year. And some of those steepest drops have been technology, transportation, and other sectors that experienced frenzied hiring sprees in 2021 and early 2022. Now, what we've heard in these earnings reports is that many of these companies overhired. But I want to take you back to what we just read there because it tells us something very important. We're seeing deflation in wages on a year-over-year -year rate of change. Of course, what that means, of course, is you start looking forward and wondering, how are we going to get a second bout of inflation if wages are coming down? Well, it's not likely to happen at all. As overall wage growth continues and has surpassed inflation, this has gotten policymakers super excited lately, saying that, look, indeed, there's going to be a problem as wages go up and inflation comes down. But we're going to make the case while they're both going to continue going down. And in June, the first time in two years as consumer prices increases slowed. Still, wage growth peaked last summer and has since declined to 5.7%, according to the Labor Department. And here's a chart that is one we'll say that matters the most here because we're not just looking at wages, we're looking at how much people work, how many hours they put in. Because it doesn't matter if you make a million dollars an hour, if you work one minute, it doesn't math doesn't work out very well. So here's the same cases. They're focused on you know what the wage growth is and not looking at what the hours worked are that go with that. And that's why we're gonna look at total compensation here on this chart. Here you can see in blue. This is average hourly earnings times average weekly hours for production and non-supervisory employees. And then in red, we've got that against the consumer price index. And here's what everyone's excited about right now. Say, so look, for the first time, wages are now above the consumer price index. Look, it doesn't really matter. We can look back at other stages and say, look, there are periods that does happen. And what's, what we're hearing from the Wall Street Journal is demand for workers is going down, wages is going down, and that means this blue line is going to continue to fall. Now, there's two ways this kind of works itself out. Those who have a higher wage are not going to get pay cuts. They're likely to see their hours cut. Or what you happen to see also happen is people lose their jobs. It all factors together, suggesting that this notion that inflation is resurging is not going to happen. Because new hires account for less than 4% of all employed workers each month, what we see it can take a while for these adjustments in their pay to show up in the federal data. The mass layoffs may, many large companies have conducted lately, particularly in tech, have helped push salaries for new hires downward. 
and other companies are no longer facing pressure to match these meta-sized offers. And so that is telling us that yes, Everything we know about the economy here is slowing. Not only do we see demand in terms of the consumer price index coming down, but we're seeing now demand for labor starting to fall, and that's pushing wages down. And while that will make the Fed happy in terms of hitting their inflation target, it's not good for the economy at all. And here you can see against the four week moving average initial claims in red, we still have total compensation in blue. And what I want you to see is total compensation falls. Now we're going back all the way to the 60s here. You see total compensation slows down. What happens? Initial claims go higher as labor demand falls and employers say, hey, you know what? We're gonna shed some of these high cost employees and maybe you later on come back and pick them up at a lower rate. Here you can see total compensation down again, four week moving average initial claims higher. You see it over and over, even in the 80s and 70s and 80s during the high inflation periods. But look now, in our modern economy, our global economy, the same effect continues to happen over and over again, everyone is saying no, initial claims aren't going higher, the employers need to keep these people, and what we're seeing is the opposite of that trend beginning now. And here from, we see now from the government, half a million U.S. jobs are at risk of vanishing in a payroll revision and what appears to be the government cooking the books, but maybe not quite. J.P. Morgan Chase is estimating that on Wednesday's government's preliminary benchmark revision will shave nearly half a million jobs off the total non-farm employment in March. This will be about 40,000 fewer jobs per month, but not to worry. They even say with a downward revision of that size, the average job growth would still be strong around 300,000 payrolls a month and not fundamentally alter anybody's view. But it will alter our view a little bit because now we're going to take that non-farm payroll report. We're going to change it, keep it on the change of thousands of persons, just as you see it when it comes out in the reports. And we're going to put that against total compensation. Now, I've had to cut off the pandemic part because it just skews us where you can't see it. But I can assure you the trend is the same. What, look at this. As total compensation goes down, non-farm payroll growth goes down. And you see it over and over again throughout every cycle here, suggesting that any future notion that the non-farm payroll report is going to be a blockbuster number is highly unlikely. Again, this all comes back to validating the Fed and their goal to get inflation down. But what we're seeing here is a trend the economy is slowing. And wait till you see what's going on with FedEx. Of course, we got to get to the banks because they're in trouble too. And once a year, the BLS also benchmarks the March payrolls level to a more accurate but less timely data source called the Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages. And that data is based on state unemployment insurance tax records and covers nearly all U.S. jobs. So once the March payroll figures are aligned to that count, the change is proportionally distributed across the year ended in March. So no way they're cooking the books, but they are going to adjust it and probably to the downside. The durability of the labor market is key to the resilience of the U.S. economy, and economists have been closely watching it for signs of weakness as job gains have gradually moderated but continue to indicate robust labor demand. Well, what we're hearing from the Wall Street Journal is that robust demand is going away because obviously if there was demand, wages would continue to go higher, not actually be contracting from this time last year, and that is a dangerous thing for a lot of workers. We need to see wages go higher to keep up the economy. Again, this inflation issue, people still can't afford it, and that's a big problem. And what's coming soon? Well, the student loan repayments, and that's gonna tap in and cut back discretionary spending in a big way, along with these higher credit card interest rates being minimum payments are up. There's a lot of issues here that are cut discretionary spending back, and if wages continue to slow and decline, well, that's not gonna help either. And investors now are wary of commercial property risk, hold back on loans because we lead into what's going on with these banks. Because as we've talked about, bank lending has plunged as regulations tighten. But one thing that shouldn't be plunging, well, that's your trading account. Here's an update on our China trade. This again, from a subscriber, hacking the report, saying I'm gonna use it to short the market, saying, look, I saw your show. I saw what you're talking about with China. Makes sense, the market's going down. They can't even prop it up. But here would have been the initial trade 
great. I'll show you right here. This is what he did on the report. It's still up 13% as of today. But what's powerful about this is not that we had that initial indicator of where the machines are gonna sell out of their longs, but look at this. Here's from today's report on our fast algorithm that looks at the machines that trade the market really quick. They're max short. And how about the slower ones? They're almost at max short. And what's cool about our report is because we do a historical overlay, it gives us a lead of where the machines are headed with their trades. Of course, remember from the Sunday show, we talked about global equity selling off. Well, here you're seeing it, our report giving you a lead on that, along with a ton of other things. Again, now comes with a 14-day money-back guarantee. It's a mere 30 bucks a month. As you can see, one trade pays for the whole subscription, which would be better than what's going on with the banks. The dollar volume of new commercial property loans by investor-driven lenders, such as private equity and debt funds, tumbled a whopping 60% in the second quarter from a year earlier, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association. Even bank origination slid 69%, according to the data, which includes multifamily financing. And why all this matters is because what does a debt-based economy need to continue to grow? new loans and here again we're seeing it and a, a slowdown in lending a slowdown in hiring does this all matter together well it does and while new loans at higher rates are potentially lucrative for investors concerns are mounting that the defaults will increase we're going to look at that here in a moment as property valuations fall and landlords struggle to keep up with payments on floating rate debt lenders can't easily hike costs without putting more borrowers at risk of distress so they're decided it's better to wait but maybe it's too late. And here we're gonna look at total compensation again. We've got average hourly earnings against average weekly hours of production and non-supervisor employees continuing our trend here against commercial industrial lending. Now we can go back into the 60s and 70s and, and we don't see quite the tight correlation, but getting into the 80s, I want you to see here, as total compensation growth slows, look what happens to commercial industrial lending. It goes down. In fact, it goes down with a lag because people suddenly are not feeling optimistic about the economy. They're seeing their wage grow slow, so they're not out lending or borrowing because it makes sense. If people are optimistic about their future, what do they want? Instant gratification. Buy now, go get financed because don't worry, you can pay it later. But when the times chart to change, people's borrowing habits as well. And here we can see that's happening again as payroll growth continues to slow down. What we can expect is, of course, commercial industrial lending is on the verge of contracting, and that will just accelerate to the downside total compensation because if we don't have new money growth to sustain the economy, well, what happens next? Well, if you said delinquencies, you got it. Because now we can take the same total compensation and overlay the delinquency rate on all loans that on a year on year rate of change as well. And lo and behold, with no surprise, what we can see as total compensation slows, what do you know that an increase in delinquency rate goes right alongside it. Here you can see that again around 1994, 95, the same effect happened. You see it going into the dot com bubble. Here again, to the great global financial crisis. That was obvious. There were so many delinquencies, as many of you remember, but it was obvious when we look at this chart because people couldn't afford those payments on those interest only loans those variable rate loans were ratcheting higher they couldn't afford it so they go into delinquency here we're seeing that trend already people can't afford to make payments on their loans so the idea here that for the first time in you know years that we're seeing total compensation above the consumer price index for one month that's get policy makers all excited is really meaningless it's way too late the economy doesn't react that fast. And what we're seeing is the ship here has already sailed. We should expect more delinquencies and a whole lot lending and a whole lot less wage growth in the near future. And now let's take a look at these banks because this, again, all comes back to the banks and the next round of failures. And now we see from S&P has joined Moody's in cutting U.S. banks amid a tough climate as they decline in deposits. They're saying is squeezing liquidity well in a big way. Just two weeks after Moody's Investor Services rattled financial stocks by cutting the ratings for a slew of U.S. banks, S&P Global Ratings is downgrading and dimming its outlook for several more, citing a mix of similar pressures making life tough for lenders. And look at this. They lowered grades on one notch for Key Corp, Comerica, Valley National, UMB, Associated Bank Corp. And this on Monday, it also lowered its outlook for River City Bank, s and Bank to negative, 
and its view of Zions Bancorp remains negative after the review. So this is not a good omen for the banks. But is this a surprise to us? Well, not really, because we've noted in the recent shows from last week that that bank term funding program that the Fed has to keep the banks alive by allowing them to swap their upside down assets for cash, well, the usage of that continues to go higher. And at some point, I believe it's about seven months from now, those original loans come due, where are banks are going to get the money to pay for it? Because they don't have it now. And many depositors have shifted their funds into higher interest bearing accounts, which has been a big problem for the banks who desperately need deposits. The decline in deposits has squeezed liquidity for many banks, while the value of their securities, which makes up a large part of liquidity, has fallen. And federally assured banks were sitting on more than $550 billion in unrealized losses on their available for sale and held to maturity securities as of the middle of the year. And he goes, you know, we talk about why rates are going back to zero. And everyone says, no, rates are only going higher. They're only going higher. Wait till the next cycle of banks starts to fail. There will be one solution, one solution only, and that will be to drive interest rates all the way back to zero to at least undo these unrealized losses or at least attempt to, to give the banks a chance to sell them to raise cash. If you don't believe me, hang tight. That day is indeed coming. And looking ahead, the situation may worsen for banks if the Fed holds rates higher for longer than previously anticipated, further eroding the value of loans to borrowers who need to refinance. Look, the bigger issue here isn't that the fact that banks are getting worse has nothing to do with high interest rates. Look, banks like high interest rates. And right now they need to lend at high interest rates so they can pay depositors more money because they're competing with the Fed. The issue here is the inverted yield curve is causing lending standards to tighten, which means banks aren't lending as much, which is not creating enough new money into the economy. And if we see a contraction in commercial industrial lending, as we've said, which is coming soon, what that means is you're going to see a further destruction of money in the economy. And when you have a debt-based economy, that is absolutely the worst thing that can happen. It starts to spin you right into an automatic recession, and if not something worse, called a financial crisis. And we know that's coming because the banks still have not healed from earlier this year. And looking ahead, the situation may worsen for banks, we'll say stating the obvious, if the Fed holds rates higher for longer, and for, uh, we already got that, but now let's turn to FedEx, who we've got. This is really important. Like I said, we're not here to ship packages because their pilots are worried about their jobs. Now, this has nothing to do with what's going on with the pilots specifically because that is an issue in itself. But here's the real tell. Check this article out. One sentence changes the game and tells us everything we know about the global economy is true. A sharp drop in package volume and a move to combine FedEx Express and ground delivery created a glut of pilots, but rewind the first part here, a sharp drop in package volume telling us everything we need to know about the global economy, that it is indeed slowing down. This is now coming back to the Wall Street Journal article that says, look, employers don't need to pay people as much as they were. Again, slower payroll growth, meaning people can't afford as much against inflation, less demand, validating coming now to FedEx. What do we see? Less demand what do we see coming forward more student loan repayments all that coming back less demand is here we're seeing the banks they're not lending as much why less demand less hope less optimism about the future of the economy well, this is telling us is we're now staring the recession right in the face and with that i'm steve van meter thanks for watching thanks for being fans bye now